I have never written or spoken about this to anyone until now. I remember how desolate I felt when Frida and Lawrence left for Italy, though soon after I also left for England. I went up to Scotland to see my father and mother. I found the same difficulty I was again, the child. I slumped back into a pattern I had not been in for years. My father had no interest in me. As far as I could make out, my mother, I think, was shy of me. But I was on my way to Italy, to Capri. Then Lawrence said he was coming, that he had been sick, that Frida had her daughters with her, that the three women had ganged up against him and he was deathly tired and he would be arriving alone in a few days. One night, the trip to Italy took a fate-filled turn. Lawrence walked into my room, suddenly in his dressing gown. I do not believe in a relationship unless there is a physical relationship as well, he said. I was frightened and excited. He got into my bed, turned and kissed me. I can still feel the softness of his beard still feel the tension, still feel the overwhelming desire to be adequate. I was passionately eager to be successful, but I had no idea what to do. Nothing happened. Suddenly Lawrence got up. It's no good, he said and stalked out of the room. I was devastated, helpless, bewildered. All the next day, Lawrence was a bit glum. Nothing was said. And I was too tense and nervous to say anything, even if I had known what to say. That night, he walked into my room and said, let's try it again. So again, he got into my bed and there we lay. I felt so desperate. All my love I had for him, all the closeness to him spiritually, the passionate desire to give what I felt I should be giving was frustrated by fear and not knowing what to do. I tried to be loving and warm and female. He was, I think, struggling to be successfully male. It was hopeless. A hopeless, a horrible, Failure. He got up, finally, stalked out of the room and turned to me, saying, Your pubes are all wrong. This left me ashamed. 
bewildered, miserable. After hours of self-torment, misery and agony, I slept. Next morning early, I heard a movement in the next room. I got up and opened the door to find Lawrence busily packing. I have to go, he said. I can't stay. He was in a towering rage. Again, I was suddenly possessed with the mysterious ability to calm him down. No, I said, you can't do that. You can't go. I can't stay, he said. I have to go. No, I said, you will stay and I will go. We can say I have to go down to Naples for my citizenship papers. I will go and you will stay. That is the simplest and the best plan. By now he had calmed down and realised that perhaps it was the best plan. So I packed my suitcases. He went out and ordered a carriage. Even then I was hoping he would not let me go. But the carriage arrived and he and I drove miserably down to Amorphi. I caught the boat to Capri, a direct boat. I stood in my white coat on the deck. Lawrence returned to the carriage. As he drove away to Ravello, he waved and waved to me. And I waved back. I can see myself even now standing on that deck in that white coat, waving to him until he vanished round a bend. I never saw him again. And I have never cared to wear anything white since. I went back to Taos, to the ranch. For the first week, I was entirely alone. And the powerful aura of Lawrence was everywhere. Oh, I felt him so strongly. I could see him sitting under his favourite tree with his copybook his straw hat. The whole place was alive with him. But I was lonely. Desperately lonely. Not only the isolation of deafness, the loneliness of being alone. I had Prince, my horse, chipmunks, squirrels, pack rats. But I was terribly and sickeningly lonely. Then the Indians came, bringing with them their tranquility and their competence. Rufina, Trinidad's wife, would borrow some small children, little Benita, me and Bambino, was one child of about three or four, a charming boy. Others were smaller. These babies would put on a dance for me in the evening, Trinidad beating the drum and singing and the babies going round and round in a circle very solemnly. Then there would be a ceremony at the Kiva, at the Pueblo. They would all disappear for several days, returning with friends. It was during this time I really learned to know the Indians, their reverence for the earth. To see Trinidad planting potatoes in the garden was like watching a religious ceremony. Each potato was planted carefully in its hole. Every drop of the earth was precious and the animals were the source of life and water, preservation of water. All of this began to seep into me. I learned a great deal from those days in the woods, on the mountains, a great deal from my aloneness 
the silence around me was not the silence of deafness in spite of my not hearing the flow of water the birds and the animal calls one became one became aware of vibrations of a different more subtle form of communication I could hear the mountain gods calling. <laughs> I would watch the trees dancing before the coming of rain. I also learned to say nothing on these things except to the Indians. Trinidad would look at me and say, yes, I have seen the trees dancing with each other and describe the dance to me, two trees bowing and dancing to each other on a windless day, deep in the forest where he had been fishing. The lovely, shadowy, attentive woods. Every move one made was watched, known, appraised. I became more aware, more attentive, to the silent, invisible life around me. The Indians taught me much of their inner way of life, their closeness to the earth, their reverence and respect for the earth that maintained their lives, their calmness, their contented and well-behaved children. I learned to live from within myself, from my own resources. And that is the most important lesson one can learn.